Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved April and all those affected by today's Dark Case. April Millsap was born on January 2, 2000 in Wise County, Virginia. She was born to her mother Jennifer Millsap and her father Bobby. April grew up in the small town of Armada which is about one hour north of Detroit. April attended school at Krause Elementary and everybody who knew her described her as friendly, as compassionate and intelligent. She loved writing short stories, poetry and she had a love of animals. Sometime during April's early life, her mother Jennifer, a woman who had a speech impediment, remarried. April's stepfather was David Lichtenfeld, a man who doted after April like she was his own daughter. There were dozens of pictures of the two of them sharing tender moments. These spanned throughout her young and early teenage years. David also taught April how to fight. At 14 years old, April Millsap was looking forward to the rest of her life. She had just wrapped up middle school and she was now preparing to start at Armada High School in the fall of 2014. At this age, she now had a boyfriend. She had an affectionate dog named Penny and she was surrounded by friends and family who knew and loved her dearly. Armada, Michigan is a small town with under 2,000 people. It was a type of place where everybody knew everybody. The Armada police force comprised of an elderly chief, a man named Howard Smith, and his deputy. Just 10 or so part-time deputies supplemented the active duty officers, but on most days, the sleepy town didn't need it. The only crimes that ever happened in Armada were the occasional theft or some illicit substance use. Most Armada citizens felt safe leaving their doors unlocked at night. Armada was the type of small town that you moved to when you wanted to start a family. But after Thursday, April 24th, 2014, all of that changed. April sat down to a crunch salad lunch and received an affectionate back rub from her stepfather. This was before he headed out the door for his night job. They exchanged goodbyes as he left, and at around 5.30pm she went for an evening stroll with her dog, Penny. They walked along the Macomb Orchard Trail, a popular hiking trail in Armada. As they walked, they enjoyed each other's company as they always did, before a man on a motorcycle rode up to them. I think I almost got kidnapped, OMFG. April frantically texted her boyfriend after encountering a mysterious man on the orchard trail. He had ridden up to her on his blue and white motorcycle and wore a helmet. The man tried propositioning April, but she rebuffed him and doubled back the way she'd come. A man on a walk with his two young daughters witnessed the entire exchange. But even with their presence, April did not feel safe. She sent a text message to her boyfriend at around 6.30pm. Here she shared what had happened. However, April didn't get a reply from him before tragedy struck. The mysterious man found April once again, but this time he refused to take no for an answer. He snuck up on her and swung at her head with his motorcycle helmet. This attack understandably floored April. She hadn't seen it coming. Then he dragged her off the path and ripped off her clothes. He attempted to take her, but April fought back. When April's resistance proved too much, he struck her with his motorcycle helmet then shoved her to the dirt and stomped on her neck. He didn't let up his foot until April had permanently stopped breathing. Devoted dog Penny, who'd found April's body, bolted away down the trail. When April did not return home that evening, Jennifer Millsap texted her daughter to find out where she was. After three to four unanswered texts, she called her phone. However, it now went to voicemail. The mother grew increasingly concerned. 
She called the only person who might know where April was, her boyfriend. He hadn't seen her, but revealed helpful information that alarmed Jennifer more than anything else. He'd received that text message from April, the one that said, I think I almost got kidnapped. Jennifer called stepfather David, sobbing and telling him that April was missing. David left work immediately and rushed home to Jennifer. They hopped into the car and went into town searching for their daughter. After hours of failing to find April, they called the Armada police and told them that April was missing. After word spread that April was now missing, thousands of tips began to flow in. One was from the father who'd seen the strange motorcyclist talking with April. The police immediately began to investigate this mystery man. But before they could find him, a 911 call came in. At 8.30pm, a couple came across Penny at the intersection of Fulton and Depot Street. At first, they thought he was a stray, but on their way back from their walk, they heard Penny whimper and whine, and it occurred to them that she might be trying to tell them something. So they followed Penny and it led them deep into the woods. There they found clothing scattered around. At first they thought it was just trash, but then they saw her. April lay on the ground with most of her clothes removed. She had a deep shoe print on her neck. They weren't able to tell her age or identity because they refused to get closer to the body. This is that 911 call. 
To find out someone would do this is just unbelievable. I can't understand it. Stuff like this happens, but you never expect it to happen like near where you live. Police say Millsap left her Armada home just after 5 Thursday afternoon to walk the trail with her dog, something she did every day. Normally she's out for about uh, 35 to 45 minutes with the dog. She was out for about an hour and a half. The, the mother became alarmed. During a mother's panic, joggers noticing a border collie running in and out of a wooded area along the trail. When April Millsap's body was found, her beloved dog Penny was still there guarding her, the only known witness to a horrific murder. Penny loved April. Whenever April came out of the room in the morning, she was there. Upon examination, the coroner's office stated that she died of asphyxia. This was from her windpipe being crushed. As well as this, the blunt force trauma caused by the helmet left an indentation on her skin post-mortem. Police ruled April's death as murder, the first in Armada in 40 years. Michigan State Police and the FBI were called in to help Armada's small police department. Police ransacked the crime scene, bagging shoes, clothes, hair and every stray piece of evidence. There were 188 exhibits when they were done, but none of them had the DNA, fingerprints, hair, fibres or fluids of the killer. Oddly though, April's phone and bag were not found at her location, but some distance away. As detectives continue to investigate tips and leads into who killed 14-year-old April Millsap, we're getting a clearer picture of what kind of person she was. We're told she was a young woman of faith who was kind to all around her, and that's making her death more difficult for loved ones to understand. The chorus of voices lifting up song and prayer, proof that a beloved teenager left a lasting impression in this community. April was the kindest girl anyone could meet. She was friends with everyone and she had a wonderful and beautiful personality. More than 200 people gathered at St. Mary Mystical Rose Church in Armada to remember 14-year-old April Millsap. Her body discovered by joggers Thursday night near the trail April knew so well. The shock of the news still fresh several days later. To be here and be strong for the kids of this parish, it's a difficult day for all of us. April school friends hang on to their best memories. Her smile. She had a gorgeous smile. She was a gorgeous young lady. Even on her bad days, she would try to make everyone else around here feel better. And, you know, that's one of the things I'll never forget about her. As family members hope and pray for clues of who killed April and why. April's grandfather in Florida tells 7 Action News he doesn't think April was a random target. It would help us define the culprit, and we certainly kind of feel like it's somebody that she knew. Police are still searching for two men spotted in this gray box van that was seen circling the area April's body was found. The police turned their attention back to the person of interest, the man spotted by the father of two. They switched their focus, looking for new leads. However, at this time, nothing new came in. They had the witness who'd spotted the mystery man sit down with an artist. Together, they created a composite sketch which they released to the public. The evening news declared the mystery man a person of interest and potentially the last person who'd seen April alive. They had already ruled out the family, the boyfriend and anybody else who'd seen April that day. All they had left was the man on the motorbike. And it wouldn't take long for them to find out exactly who it was. An officer spotted a motorcycle to match the witness's description. They traced it to a nearby township called Wales. It was the home of a father and son, James Van Callis Sr. and James Van Callis Jr. James Sr. was a registered offender, but this time the police were not there for him. Instead, they were there for his 33-year-old son, James Jr. James's facial features were a strong match for the sketch that had been compiled. They attempted to contact James to bring him in for questioning, but he was unresponsive, giving them probable cause for a warrant. On July the 30th, they stormed James's house looking for evidence to tie him to April's murder, but they find no evidence directly connecting him to April. What the police did find, though, was illicit substances. Therefore, they arrested James Jr. for possession, but they did not doubt he was also responsible for April's demise. All they had to do now was prove it. 
The evidence they were looking for came from an unusual but all the same reliable source. It was April's phone. She had a fitness app on since the moment she left the house. It tracked her location and the steps that she covered. When they overlaid it with the precise location data from Google Earth, FBI agents were able to recreate the last 63 minutes of her life. The data showed that she had left the house. She travelled 3.6 miles an hour and she headed to the trail. She completed her walk and was returning to town when she must have encountered Van Callis. Shortly after, at around 6.28, she sent the message to her boyfriend. Moments after the text, her steps formed several zigzag patterns. The police assumed this was signs of the struggle. An FBI investigator who examined April Millsap's phone was able to pinpoint every step of her final 63 minutes for the jury. Data from a workout app shows her traveling at about 3.6 miles an hour through town. Then the Orchard Trail. Just before doubling back, the track zigzags in a circular fashion. Then there were three outgoing calls at 621, 622 and 623. The location of these calls was where April's body was found. She tried to call for help in her final moments. If it were not for the next actions that Van Callis took, they might have never connected him to April's murder. Shortly after her demise, her cell phone started moving at over 13 miles per hour before abruptly stopping. They found April's phone where the app stopped and they combed through CCTV in the direction that the motorcycle was heading. They found Van Callis at a gas station, not far from the location where April's cell phone had pinged. And with that, the police had him. That was what clinched it for me, police head Smith said. It was enough information to go to trial and the people of Armada rejoiced at the news. The town adored April. They all stood in solidarity, mourning her passing. They erected shrines, wore pink clothes and tied bows. Pink was April's favourite colour, after all. Van Callis was also no hero to the people of Armada. He was popular with the criminal elements of the town and had been previously charged with robbery, along with the refusal to pay child support in 2005 and 2006. After a preliminary hearing, James Van Callis Jr. was charged with a long list of crimes. This included first-degree murder for the death of April. His trial began in early March after being denied bail. This was due to his prior illicit substance charge and extensive history with the courts. And despite the prosecution being sure of themselves, they had a hard time proving James Van Callis had killed April. After all, there was no DNA evidence connecting him to the scene of the crime. This was a fact that the prosecution hammered on again and again. His attorney, Azar Sheikh, cast doubt on whether James was even at the location at all. The police found no tire tracks or tread prints except the one on April's neck, a mark allegedly caused by a shoe. Just as it was beginning to look like James could walk away unpunished, the prosecution called a surprise witness that turned James's defence upside down. This witness was his ex-girlfriend. She had some interesting things to say about the night that April Millsap died. Crystal Stadler was living with Van Callis around the time that April was killed. She said that Van Callis was out of the house during the window that the police estimated the murder occurred. And when he returned home later that night, he was acting weird. She woke up in the middle of the night to see him cleaning his shoes with disinfectant. She thought this was strange since her boyfriend never washed his shoes. And this wasn't really something you'd do in the middle of the night. When Van Callis Jr. climbed back into bed, he told Crystal that he'd messed up and needed her to stay by his side. Does he say anything to you when he comes back to bed? Yeah, that he messed up and he needed me to stand by his side. Stadler's testimony gets worse for Van Callis, saying he asked her to wash his clothes, something that never happened, and... Did you find something unusual in the Carhartt jacket after you washed it? Yeah. What was it that you found? Like wadded up hair and like shavings of grass or like hay. Hair that she says belonged to a person, not an animal. And then Stadler says Van Callis asked everybody in the house to lie about what kind of shoes he had on the day the young girl was killed. What was he telling to everybody in the house? To tell them that, that he was wearing K-Swiss shoes. 
Was he wearing K-Swiss shoes that night? No. The shoe model that he'd been cleaning up had a tread. This tread matched up closely to the marks left on April's body. While the particular shoe was not found in Van Callis' home during their search, the prosecution proved that he had those particular brand of shoes by showing a video Van Callis Jr. had recorded on his cell phone earlier on that year. Things got much worse for Van Callis when his partner discussed what he asked her to do next. James asked her to wash his clothes, which, according to Crystal, never happened. But she did agree to carry out the task. However, before doing so, she went through the trousers and found clumps of human hair and grass shavings. James Van Callis Jr. was found guilty by the jury. However, he didn't give up the fight. He said the following in his closing statement, There is no evidence that shows that I did anything wrong. There's nobody that can identify that my motorcycle was on the trail that day. None of the witnesses could positively identify me. They said they saw eyes. How many people have eyes that are that shape? This is a sad chain of events that I'm somehow wrapped up in. I don't know her. I've never met her. April's mother also had the opportunity to confront James. She rounded her speech off with a strong phrase. I pity you, and I hate you, and I can never forgive you. On March the 30th, 2016, James Van Callis Jr. was sentenced to life without parole, something which was met with jubilation, cheers and claps of April's friends and family. Over 200 people gathered at St. Mary Mystical Rose Church to say a final goodbye to April after the trial was finally over. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think can be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. And remember, if you appreciate what I'm doing here, please do hit that like button. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.